I didn't want them to be traditional monsters, like griffins and gorillas and such like. I wanted them to be very, very personal. They had to come out of my own particular life. And I remember it took a very long time until that gestation occurred and where they began to appear on drawing paper and they began to be what I liked. And it was only when I had them all that I realized they were all my Jewish relatives of my childhood. You know, people come on Sunday and wait to get fed, uncles and aunts, and they all say the same dumb thing while you're beating time till food gets put on the table, how big you are and how fat you got, and you look so good we can eat you up. In fact, we knew they would because my mother was the slowest cooker in Brooklyn, so if she didn't hurry up, they would eat us up. So the only entertainment was watching their bloodshot eyes and how bad their teeth were. You know, children are monstrously cruel about physical defects. You know, the hair curling out of the nose and the weird mole on the side of the head. And so you would glue in on that, and then you'd talk about it with your brother and sister later. And they became the wild things. Well, it's typically 30s in many ways in that uh, series of long illnesses. But then there were no drugs and there was no penicillin, so kids all ended up having diphtheria, scarlet fever, pneumonia, blah, blah. And I spent a lot of time being sick, as I recollect. One of the happiest memories I have is when my grandmother would come to stay with us on those occasions, and she would put me on her lap, and then she used the window shade like a magic lantern. And she'd pull it down, and then I'd hold my breath, and she'd pull it up, and the same thing would be there, a car or my brother and sister making a snowman or whatever. Uh, the window became my movie camera, my television set, uh, so happy memories are being indoors, looking out of windows, and it was inconceivable to me as a child that I would be an adult. <laughs> I mean, one assumed that would happen, but obviously it didn't happen, or if it did, it happened when your back was turned and then suddenly you were there. So I couldn't have thought about it much. I mean, they were mostly dreadful, and if the option were to become an adult was to become another dreadful creature, then best not. Although, I think there had to be a kind of normal anticipation of that moment happening because being a child was even worse. I mean, being a child was being a child, was being a creature without power, without pocket money, without escape routes of any kind. So I didn't want to be a child. I remember how much, when I was a small boy, I was taking to see a version of Peter Pan. I detested it. I mean, the sentimental idea that anybody would want to remain a boy I don't. I couldn't have thought it out then, but I did later. Certainly, that this was a conceit that could only occur in the mind of a very sentimental writer. That any child would want to remain in childhood. It's not possible. The wish is to get out. Well, odd things. Um, I don't know if my books are about that. By the way, I mean they are probably partly that, but I, I don't set out to write a book that's going to conquer fear or do anything but amuse or entertain or distract the child. But my own fears were very peculiar. Um, I was terrified of the vacuum cleaner. You know, all untraditional. I mean, people sit around saying, well, don't let kids do that and don't let kids do that. It'll be too frightening. But who would have ever imagined? But when my mother plugged the vacuum cleaner in, and it was those old-fashioned Hoovers, you know, the thing blew up visibly, and the sight of that bag swelling used to just drive me right up the wall, literally. I had to get out of the house and... I was sent to the neighbors until she was all done. Definitely led me to being an insomniac for the rest of my life. And it was from that moment on that my sister had to stay with me until I fell asleep. I don't remember that. But I do remember I was a very close companion to death. And I remember a game my father played with me, which he would not exactly call a death game, but did move in that direction, which was that if I lay in bed, which I spent a lot of time doing, and I remember in one particular place we lived in Brooklyn, we moved quite frequently because of financial problems, and just opposite the foot of my bed was a window looking out in the backyard facing a just very boring brick wall. And he said, if you, to me, if you looked and didn't blink, if you saw an angel, you'd be a very, very lucky child. And so I did that frequently. And of course, I would always blink because it hurt not to blink. And then you didn't see it. And he'd say, well, you blinked, didn't you? And I'd say, yes. And I remember once I didn't blink. And I saw it. 
<laughs> or I imagine I saw it, but it, the memory of it is so vivid I could even describe it to you. I was lying in the bed, obviously, staring out the window, my eyelids aching, my eyes aching, staring, 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 and something very large, like almost like a dirigible, but it wasn't a dirigible because it was right past my window, is a slow-moving angel. She moved very gracefully and slowly, not turning to observe me at all. I don't have a memory of the face, but I remember a memory of the hair, the body, and the wings. I was... It took my breath away. It just moved so slowly that I could examine it quite minutely. And then I shrieked and hollered, and my father came in. I said, I saw it. And he said, I was a very lucky kid. I, I can't really describe it. I really can't tell you what it meant. It was a very internal feeling, but it came out of such a complex awareness as a child of, of the fragility of life. There is a story which I can't prove, but I was told that at a very early age, my parents dressed me. It's a religious custom or superstition from the old country. They dressed me all in white from top to toe so that if God is watching, he would have thought me already an angel and he would not pluck me. And I wouldn't die, in other words. I would be a fraudulent angel. Uh, this is a superstition, and it does occur in old villages in the old country. I don't know that it happened to me. But it's significant that it was a family story, so that it told me how uh, forcefully they were concerned about me. His wolf call, Vildakaya, Mami Mia, Mia Mami O. Okay, Vildakai is literally a wild thing. And it's what almost every Jewish mother or father says to their offspring. You're acting like a Vildakai, stop it. When you're climbing on the furniture, you're doing all these things. Um, so that was the title of the book. Yeah.